uh, I work at the Tennessee State Museum in community engagement, and we're so happy for you to join us for our in conversation on the suffrage movement in minority communities after the 19th Amendment. Um, before we get to the panel, we're going to have a uh, section where we talk about the history of what this uh, movement looked like in minority communities. Uh, before we start that, though, um, a few rules. Um, you probably saw it uh, if you um, were here earlier, but please make sure you're muted. You should be muted upon entry, uh, but uh, you check that, check the audio, and um, that way we have no problems um, from sound interference. Uh, if you have any questions, um, just activate the chat box and you can do that uh, by clicking on the buttons at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's one that looks like a little text bubble. If you click that, your chat box should come up and have it set, the drop down set to all panelists. That way um, our tech person, Rachel Helvering, um, it'll be uh, the TSM education. Uh, she'll be able to help you with any questions. Um, also, if you have any questions for the panelists, um, at the end, we're going to have a, a Q&A. And so you can shoot in questions at any point of this event. Okay, now I'm going to get started. Um, Again, this is going to be just a brief history of the suffrage movement after the 19th Amendment is passed. So between the years of 1920 and 1990. And for um, oftentimes this narrative is tied to, uh, this historical narrative is tied to Black Americans. And that makes sense, uh, given that during the majority of this time period, um, Black Americans are the second highest racial population, especially in the South, um, where their rights and, and civil liberties were blatantly suppressed. But, uh, and while that's very important uh, to learn about, absolutely, um, even uh, because the civil, uh, the civil rights movement um, would come to influence and um, inspire other movements and minority groups. Um, it, oftentimes the, um, the movements in Native American groups, Asian American, Latino Americans, and in people with disabilities, their, um, their histories get overlooked. And in Tennessee in particular, um, early on, these groups uh, were particularly small. And so even if they were taking part in um, the fight for the vote or fight for um, civil rights, um, we don't know much about it. Um, but it's important to talk about this history, even if it happened in other states, because this these people they're in much larger quantities um, now and that history is part of their history and so we should talk about that um, and what i'll be going over is uh, are some of the ways that minority communities uh, had their votes suppressed and how in turn they um, resisted either directly or indirectly and um, before I talk about that, it's important to uh, note that even though I'm grouping uh, these examples together, um, minority groups don't experience things all the same way. Um, even within the groups, they have uh, different opinions. Um, but this is just an overview, uh, so you can get a feel for how important voting actually is. Uh, we're going to start with different suppression tactics, and uh, this is just a short list. Um, generally, um, the tactics that reached all groups were stuff like poll taxes, literacy tests, knowledge tests. Uh, poll taxes were required for all citizens um, before the 24th Amendment was passed in 1962. 
And but this was a problem for um, minority groups in particular because um, they were disproportionately uh, given lower wages. And that made it hard for them to pay for things like poll taxes. And then there are other tactics that reflected the um, that reflected the lack of opportunities as well as the prejudice they faced. So um, literacy test and knowledge test um, reflect the lack of opportunities of a um, high education, um, as well as um, prejudice is seen through intimidation and harassment and violence. Uh, for some groups, the lack of language assistance is particularly uh, an issue, um, especially among uh, Native Americans, Latino Americans, Asian Americans, Arab Americans, and for people with disabilities who communicate in different ways. And um, in different periods of time, lack of citizenship or questions of residency were a problem for um, different groups as well, for uh, Native Americans, for Asian Americans, and for uh, Latino and Arab Americans. Um, and specifically for Asian Americans, uh, Chinese, um, Chinese Americans and um, immigrants were not allowed to have citizenship for 61 years. Segregation is also a form of oppression that would come to impact voting. Um, and segregation impacted all minority groups in some form of an or another because uh, oftentimes they would be pushed to areas that were uh, less desirable to uh, white Amer uh, to white people. So, um, but what that would look like, uh, what voting issues would look like dependent on the group. So um, oftentimes that would look like having fewer polling locations um, accessible to them um, or moving around or closing polling locations in order to cause confusion. Um, and especially for Native Americans that live on um, reservations, they had uh, they had the issue of distant polling locations um, because their uh, polling locations aren't allowed on their reservation. So it takes them a while to get there if they're able to go vote at all. But almost immediately you see forms of resistance. Um, and here are just a few examples. Litigation being a major form of resistance um, because it allows them to fight back uh, against these suppressions um, and bring into question the legality of the actions um, placed upon them. Uh, a lot of us know of public demonstrations being a major um, way of resistance because the purpose of public demonstrations is to um, bring to light the injustices and issues that facing to the broader public. Uh, so we often hear and see these um, more often. Um, but the importance of community groups um, abdicating and uplifting their community members uh, should not be understated. Uh, community groups often um, help uh, people and to learn, uh, educating the community on politics and combating suppression, as well as how to gain accessibility to the polls. Uh, they fundraise um, back when there were poll taxes, they fundraised um, for uh, poll taxes and provided childcare for parents who want to vote but didn't want to leave their kids alone. Um, and in indigenous communities, um, a form of resistance is learning and observing their cultures because for a, a long period of time, a way that Native Americans could receive citizenship was to reject their cultures and adopt white societal norms. And in continuing to learn and observe their cultures, they're resisting to this ideology um, pushed against them. So these are forms, a few forms of resistance. We're going to go over some examples now. Um, first with uh, Black Americans, on the left there's an image of a pamphlet uh, for a uh, place called Tent City, and this was in Fayette County, uh, Tennessee. And 
uh, this was a situation where a displaced community grew to um, its own civil rights movement. And in uh, 1959, a, some black sharecropping, sharecropping residents registered to vote. And when they returned to their land, uh, the white landowners kicked them off the land because they were upset that they registered to vote. Um, some local residents who were sympathetic offered up uh, the land for the um, displaced community for them to live on. And from there it grew. And so this um, particular incident or situation lasted from 1959 to 1965. And they were a pretty big deal because they were a rural community um, that had this foot in the civil rights movement. You don't really see that much. Um, on the left is an image of Martin Luther King and other prominent civil rights activists, including John Lewis, um, with the March on Selma. And the March on Selma was a um, kind of an end point uh, to the Selma voting rights campaign. And this was actually spearheaded by Diane Nash and James Bevel, uh, who got their start here in Nashville in the civil rights movement. Uh, but they were pushing for more voting rights for the black residents of Selma and the neighboring um, county. But the March on Selma is frequently referenced as the final push for the Voting Rights Amendment uh, um, Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, because of the violence they faced. For Native Americans, um, the major act that would grant them citizenship was the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And uh, before this, a lot of Native Americans were um, a, gaining citizenship in some form an, or another, um, but this would grant it to all Native Americans. Um, but that did not mean that they all got the right to vote. Uh, seven states had actually suppressed the Native vote after passing this act. And that's where you see um, activists like Zikala Sa, who is the image on the right, she was a Yatonkin Dakota Sioux member, and after um, it was evident that Native Americans weren't allowed to vote, uh, she would be fighting for suffrage for all Native Americans um, and founded the National Council on American Indians with her husband. For Asian Americans, um, this is a unique situation because, like I mentioned earlier, for 61 years, uh, they weren't allowed citizenship at all. And that was with the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in 1886. Um, after that was passed, it would end up being extended to all Asian nationalities. Uh, so the, um, pretty important moment there. Um, on the left here, we have a picture of Dr. Mabel Ping Hua Li, and she was attending college in New York City um, during the women's suffrage movement and was pushing for um, women's suffrage, giving speeches, um, and particularly to the Chinese uh, American uh, community there. Um, but when suffrage was granted uh, to women in New York, uh, she was not able to, to register because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And I'm going to move on. Um, for Latino Americans, the uh, this issue of, of voting rights um, vary depending on the nationality. Um, Puerto Rican um, Americans, Puerto Ricans um, had something um, totally different to Mexican Americans, which this slide uh, tends to focus on. Um, I'm going to point you to the right um, is a uh, public service announcement um, that was sponsored by the American GI Forum, which was an organization that got started after World War II uh, to help um, secure rights for Mexican American um, veterans. And they actually um, proclaimed the importance of voting. The poll tax uh, or the, um, the advertisement is asking everyone to pay their poll taxes. And uh, they would raise money for people who couldn't pay by holding pageants, which I thought was really cool. And finally, uh, we have the um, fight for voting rights 
for people with disabilities. And this was particularly with a focus on uh, accessibility because disabilities impact all communities, but if you can't access the polls, you really can't vote. Uh, so um, on the left, we have an image of Middle Tennessee State University Sigma Delta Sigma, which was a group that was established in 1979 to um, a, a community group that was for, that were for people with disabilities and their allies. And they would push for support for uh, the local or local support on the American with Disabilities Act, which was signed in 1990 and would come to impact um, what was available uh, or what is available at polling locations and making it more accessible for people with disabilities to vote. So again, that was just a short uh, history. There's still so much more to learn, and I encourage you to uh, go do your do that research uh, because it's amazing um, how much I learned through this experience. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists now. I'm going to get started with our moderator for the night. Her name is Tammy Edwards. She is the director of special projects, um, and. I, she's the only person I see on the screen right now, so hi, Tammy. Um, next, we have Miranda Fraley Rhodes. She is the assistant chief curator at Tennessee State Museum, and she was the lead curator for our ratified exhibit, which make sure to check out. Um, we have Tequila Johnson. She was she is the co-executive director and co-founder of the Equity Alliance, which is a nonprofit that focuses on educating uh, people. Um, and abdicating for um, uh, civil, civ civic engagement. Um, next, we have Juliana Ospina Cano, who is the Executive Director of Conexión Americas, uh, which is also a nonprofit that focuses on um, um, assisting the Latino and immigrant community here in Nashville. They have been serving the community for 20 years. And finally, we have Jean Marine Lawrence, and she is a disability rights activist as well as a member of the Tennessee Council on De Developmental Disabilities. Thank you all for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Tammy now. Thank you, Georgia. Can y'all hear me okay? All right. Well, I feel like I just went to school. I didn't learn um, any of that in school. You know, the only thing I learned about suffrage was Susan B. Anthony. And of course, we learned about the Civil Rights Act, but I didn't learn about Native Americans or what happened with Asian Americans or the Latino community. So thank you for sh um, sharing that, Joyce. But um, welcome, ladies. I'm so glad that you guys um, decided to join us. I know um, this is a very busy time. We've got a couple of mothers. Here and I know y'all are going through some stuff trying to homeschool your kids, so we appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we got a lot to talk about. I'm very excited to um, have this conversation, and it's just a conversation amongst all of us. So jump in whenever you, um, if there's a question you want to answer, if there's something else you want to add. But I'd like to begin by um, asking our um, the guests of the museum if you would share your memory of the first time that you voted or the first time that you became um, politically active. So whoever wants to jump in first, you can just unmute yourself. And Jean Marie, why don't you start? So um, the first time that I voted was actually on my 18th birthday. Um, my 18th birthday was uh, voting day, and I, I love to vote on election day. I don't. It's just something kind of magical about that for me. Um, and I remember um, I've always been very politically inclined um, and politically active, but that was just an amazing experience for me to be able to um, use my voice um, in a very powerful way. Um, the day that I became an adult. So that will always um, be a very, very fond memory for me. 
Thanks, Jean Marie. Juliana or Tequila, either of you want to share? Hi. Um, so for me, my first time voting was actually for President Barack Obama in 2008. Um, I was in college. Um, I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta, and you know anything about the sorority Delta Sigma Theta? We were founded during the women's women's right uh, women's suffrage movement um, by founders who wanted to do more, who wanted to, who saw. Uh, the 19th Amendment as an inroads to African Americans getting their right to vote. And so they strategized um, and planned and, and participated in that march and rallied people on Howard University's campus. And so my sorority sisters and I, we organized from TSU, Fisk to Meharry, got everybody together, and we all like three, four hundred students, we went to the polls and voted. And that was my first time actually be beginning to think about what it means to be politically active. So it was a rich experience, one that I feel like I will always remember. Um, but yes, very, very, <laughs> very good experience. Oh, thank you, Tequila. Juliana, would you like to share your experience? Um, and hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, Yes, in Colombia, you can vote at the age of 18. So I have dual citizenship. So I had the honor of voting in Atlanta when I turned 18 for the presidential election uh, in Colombia. But my first time voting in the United States was in this past election. I was in Washington, D.C. Um, and um, I will never forget that day, the honor uh, that that brings in the responsibility um, to be not only a first time voter, but also a Latina and immigrant um, voting in the United States uh, is not something that I take um, lightly. And I'm excited to be part of this panel and this conversation and to have um, amazing panelists alongside us. But yeah, my first time voting in the United States was in the, in the past election in, in Washington, DC. Oh, thank you, Juliana. Y'all all have such um, different experiences. And I'll share mine very quickly. Um, you know, I was working on a friend's campaign. Her dad was running for office and I was about 19 and we were helping out with the campaign. And, um, you know, so he's like, well, you know, make sure you go and vote. And I realized I hadn't even registered, <laughs> I had not even registered to vote and I was helping with this campaign. So he made sure that we got registered. And um, so that was the first time that I voted. So thank you all for sharing that. Um, but let's get into the meat of what we want to talk about tonight. And, you know, since we started talking about suffrage, um, I really like to know how women in your communities historically have they contributed to the fight for voting rights. Anybody want to start? Hi, so um, so I think, you know, if we want to talk about how women in the African American community, I do identify as an unapologetically black African American woman. Um, and I am standing on the shoulders of Frankie Pierce and Ida B. Wells and all of the women of color who came before me who fought for our rights. And so I think what we have to think about is that intersection of patriarchy and racism and what that looks like for a black woman when you are fighting against a system, you know that you have two strikes against you. One, you're a woman, we all have a strike, and then two, you're black. So there is this intersectionality between what it means to fight for rights as a woman and what it means to fight for rights as a black woman. And so when you look at our ancestors and those who came before us, they were strategic, they were humble, but they were also very fearless. You had to be fearless. And so I think that when I think about the work that I do and how I can relate to those who came before me, I always want to channel that fearlessness of you know that things aren't going to come right away. You know that it's going to be a long and a weary, a weary road. You know that you may be fighting for something that you never get to see in your lifetime, but you also know that it is your responsibility to continue that fight. And so when I think about our ancestors and I think about my ancestors and how they fought for women's rights to suffrage, I think about that, the fearlessness of being pushed to the back of that line during that parade and being taunted and being told that you don't belong here, yet they persisted. 
Yeah. And then to go to Kila, what she was saying that for me, what day say, um, we're in September 2020 talking about voter suppression and voter representation and making space for folks to be able to vote in this election. We wouldn't be here and let the, at least from the Latino immigrant origin perspective. And that's what I bring to the table today. If it wasn't for those that were fighting for the right in our voice. Uh, throughout history, and specifically in the 1960s and the 1950s, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta making sure that that movement that started at the very grassroots level included um, the most vulnerable population, specifically from my perspective, um, farm workers and Latino and immigrant origin families. And the fact that we have this amazing panel of women here again making space for these voices is just a reflection of, yes, we make strides, but on the other hand, we're still behind the fact that accessibility is one of the most um, impediments, the number one impediment for people with disabilities to go and vote. And um, Jean Marie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but also voter suppression when it comes to Black Americans and Latino and immigrant origin families. So yes, we make we make great progress, but at the end of the day, we have a long way to go. And I'm excited, and energized that we can have this conversation on making sure that we fight the good fight to ensure that every vote is counted and every vote counts, but also we encourage those who cannot vote to know that, that we are doing that work for them. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been um, legislation passed to ensure that people with disabilities have the right to vote, but the fact that there are campaigns going on today um, one most notably my favorite um, is actually um, was I, I believe spearheaded by um, Alice Wong uh, with the Disability Visibility Project and the Crypt the Vote campaign, um, and then the um, Rev Up the Vote campaign. Um, all of these things are centered around um, empowering people with disabilities to vote um, and to speak up about inaccessible polling locations. Um, my polling location is not completely accessible uh, and it's a struggle. And, uh, you know, there's so much voter suppression still for minority communities. Uh, and it's so important for us to unify our voices um, and cite that together. Um, and that's why panels like this are so important and um, women leaders uh, that are sitting here on the panel um, with me today, and I'm so glad I got to meet you all, um, is just so important because we are the leaders um, today in our communities and we have the opportunity to make these changes um, happen and to push our communities farther um, in our in our spheres and in our rights. Thank you, Jean Marie. Um, and since you kind of brought it up, I do want to talk about some of the challenges that um, people face in your communities when trying to vote, particularly during this pandemic. And I would like to start with you, Jean Marie, because I um I read an article in the Pew Trust that talked about some of the barriers that people with disabilities face. And they included, as you said, some um, accessible voting machines are not set up and some of the um, sites are not truly accessible. Sometimes earphones aren't turned on. Um, can you talk about any other barriers that people with disabilities are facing when trying to vote? Yeah, I mean, um, physical accessibility is probably my biggest barrier. Um, being in a wheelchair, but um, a lot of the volunteers don't know what um, accessibility options exist there. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they don't know that you can have someone uh, that you bring with you assist you um, in voting. Mail-in ballots are not accessible. Um, and that's probably, in my opinion, one of the biggest things is that um, if you do choose to get a mail-in ballot, uh, if you're blind, how do you read it? Um, and, you know, you have to place a lot of trust in someone else 
to assist you with your civic rights. Um, and I just, I feel like that we can do better than that in 2020. Um, you have caregivers who will um, mail in ballots from um, someone with a disability and uh, not allow them to vote. So, uh, you know, here in 2020 with all the progress that um, has supposedly been made for women in the right to vote, there is still so much to overcome and so much educating uh, to do. For sure. I do feel like people with um, disabilities are kind of on the, the the lowest rung. It's like it's the last thing people think of. It's sort of an afterthought. And being able to vote and not having an accessible polling place seems unacceptable to me. I don't understand how that happens, but it you know, is, we got a long way to go. It's it's quite interesting because we are the largest minority group in the country. Right. Um, and there's so much that people with disabilities can do to change the tide of an election. Um, and to some extent, I think maybe there's some some fear and trepidation in that. Um, and perhaps that it involves, uh, you know, some of the reasoning behind the barriers that do still exist. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to tackle that question? What are some of the challenges that your communities are facing um, with voting rights, particularly during the um, pandemic? Has that caused an extra challenge, do you think, Akila or Juliana? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh oh. Yeah, I think that um when when i when i hear about this pandemic it's interesting to me because a lot of the issues that african americans are facing right now or that the country is facing the african american community has always faced uh poverty kills more people than covid uh and that's that's my thing because we have always had barriers to voting we have always experienced this level of racism and this this level of inaccessibility to democracy, so to speak. However, COVID has highlighted it because now several people are seeing that, hey, voter suppression does exist. Hey, these things actually do happen. People do want to retain power for a small group of people. Um, so when you talk about the barriers, it's the same thing that they were experiencing before the, the, the Voting Rights Act of 65 or during after the Voting Rights Act of 65. Um, no, we don't have people riding horses with white sheets over their face, but we definitely have people who are now wearing judge robes. Uh, we de definitely have people who are sitting in state legislative seats who, who really want to make sure that they retain power for a small group of people. And unfortunately, what that looks like is poll taxes, closing of polling locations, um, gerrymandering, redistricting. I, I mean, we could go on and on and on. So, yes, those things definitely exist. They have always existed and they haven't gone anywhere. You're right. Juliana. Yeah, yeah I know. And I was, I'm so glad that Tequila brought up because, of course, voter ID laws, um, registration restrictions, racial biases in the criminal justice system, gerrymandering, and if we just think about gerrymandering as it is tied to the census, right, which is representation at the state legislature and in Congress, and it all stems for being counted and being actively engaged and how complicated it is to understand the system, right? The fact that the country in itself, it is not, organized or structured in a way that it facilitates voting, quite the opposite, that it makes it very, very difficult for individuals, specifically thinking about marginalized individuals from voting. The fact that it's not a national holiday, that the, as Tequila was mentioning, that is very difficult for many people to actually get to the polls without being reprimanded or even perhaps losing their, their job because of, of, of discrimination, right? So if we look at all these things in addition, and again, I'm bringing the immigrant origin perspective to the narrative and the pervasive narrative against immigrants in the United States and what it takes to actually step in uh, and step out um, and go and cast your vote is quite difficult in the United States. Um, the fact the administration, for example, wanted to add 
the citizenship question to the census, but it's actually the census that impacts gerrymandering, right? So regardless of, of what one feels about this particular issue, the system itself was not created to make it conducive for individuals um, to vote. So that's the reason why all of us have to make sure that we do everything in our power to facilitate that process. So we speak uh, on behalf of those who cannot exercise that vote to make sure that they're represented. And we speak against injustices related to the US Postal Services, uh, access to those um, that need it. And more importantly, that we create equitable spaces where people can actually go and vote either be vote early or vote um, on November um, the 3rd. And I'm proud of the work that many of us are doing, specifically the Equity Alliance with Tequila here, because they are actually making the system better in a way that is easier for all of us to understand that A, representation matters, and it's actually local politics, the ones that influence um, the work um, that we do every day. So again, as Tequila mentioned, we can go on and on and on. Um, but again, many of us are doing that work every single day to make sure that every count, every person is able to vote and it is counted, um, um, you know, the way that it's supposed to. Yeah, you mentioned the census. It's so important. And, you know, I think some people are really afraid now to even fill out the census. My, my father, who is deceased now, but, you know, he even got a little nervous about completing the census. He's like, why are they asking all these questions? And my sister and I have to tell them, it's important for you to fill it out, just fill it out. <laughs> but now that they're asking that, um, you know, they're trying to make it hard for people to complete the census. And now with the pandemic, and it, it has just affected everybody, but it's so important to fill it out. And it's so important to vote in local elections, like you said, Julian. It's not just the presidential election. You need to vote for these small, where you're voting for judges and things like that. So. Yeah, but it's still it's still quite a challenge. Um, I do want to bring Miranda into the conversation. Um, Miranda is our um, curator, and you know, we've been talking about um, women kind of leading the fight for uh, for votes during suffrage. Miranda, um, Joyce Joyce mentioned um, Native American women that have been fighting for suffrage, and we feature Mary Louise Baldwin. She's a Native American woman that is featured in our exhibition. Could you talk to us a little bit about um, what she did and how she helped um, advocate for suffrage for Native Americans. You know, as I was preparing for this, I, I learned that um, some Native American women had tremendous political authority within their nations. Like they could vote for um, the chiefs, they could veto the war, but that was within their nations. And, you know, they couldn't even be citizens within the United States. So could you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, Mary Louise Baldwin was a very distinguished Native American activist, and um, she had a long history of working for Native American women's rights. Um, she was a lawyer, and um, so was her father. Actually, she father she uh, followed his example, and she actually worked for the federal government. And um, she was originally from North Dakota, but both she and her father moved to Washington, D.C. to advocate for their uh, community. She was a member of the Chippewa Nation. And um, both through her work professionally and um, through her advocacy with the Society for American Indians, um, one of the things she did, uh, Tammy, which this very much speaks to what you were mentioning, she emphasized the political roles that Native American women traditionally held in their communities and helped to educate people about those roles. And um, she did a lot of activism, especially for Native American women, and was very important in helping them gain political rights, which a, a law in 1924 established a Native American citizenship, but due to a state laws um, regulating a voting rights, um, all Native Americans in the United States did not actually gain the right to vote until 1962. So that was really a long struggle. Thank you, Miranda. It's kind of like, you know, Tequila talked about that 
a lot of these women were fighting for the right to vote, knowing they wouldn't see it during their lifetime, but they still saw the importance of it. So they wanted to, they fought and, and um, you know, went to jail, starved themselves, knowing that they might not see it, but that further down the line, you know, maybe their children, their children's children um, would get the right to vote. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so let's see, you know, <clears throat> I had a conversation with um, a friend yesterday, and she's actually working on a local campaign in her, she doesn't live in the state. And someone working on the campaign with her, a young man, I believe he's an African-American young man. Now he's working on the campaign with her, but he shared with her that he didn't think he was going to vote. And she was like, sure, you're gonna vote for the person we're campaigning for, but I think he was talking about not voting in the presidential election. So my question to you all is, barring any of the barriers that we've talked about, why do you think that some people are just deciding not to vote? Which that breaks my heart that anybody's not going to vote. Um, I guess I'll go first. I think, I think well, I don't think, but I've talked to a couple tens of thousands of people across the state of Tennessee. And a lot of them are saying that they don't want to vote. And I believe the reason why is because people aren't excited about it. Um, I think during this pandemic and everything that is happening, people want to see something different. They want to see something radical. They want to see change. And they're not seeing that. And they feel like we've always voted. We've always voted. We've always voted. And we still don't see anything. We're still fighting for the same thing. So I think what has happened over the last few years is we've lost our sense of hope. People aren't hopeful that government is going to do what government says is going to do. People aren't hopeful that government is going to finance our freedom, so to speak, through the vote. People feel as though you know, government is not working. And it's sad for me because I believe in democracy. I believe in America and I believe in voting and what voting can do. But I also understand that there is a certain level of instant gratification that has to happen for people to really see change. And people have been patient and they waited for years. And all we've seen during this time is black men continue to be gunned down by police. Our president spewing racial slurs. Um, and that has not resonated well with a lot of people. They feel like, what am I going to get out of this if I continue to vote and I continue getting the same thing? That's the definition of insanity that Einstein said is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And what we're here to do as the Equity Alliance is to be unapologetically rooted in African-American culture and get people to see that the reason why democracy isn't working is not because we're not voting or because um, we vote and nobody cares, but it's because we're just using, we're looking at voting as just the entire process, but democracy is, voting is just one tool in restoring or rebuilding or sustaining democracy. We have to use all the tools in our tool belt. And, and you know, like I said, that's at the core of the kind of work that we do is trying to really give people a sense of hope. Yeah, and I would um, add to that, and I love what you said about instant gratification. I would actually, from my perspective, divide it into two groups, right? There is the individualistic nature of the United States and this democratic process where if I'm not impacted, there is a perception that we are going to be okay. And people that think that my vote doesn't really matter, right? People that say, let them vote, let them figure it out because I will be okay. When if we take a step back and see what COVID-19 in 2020 has done is elevated the perpetuation of inequities of this country for years of years. But these people that have this sense of privilege of individualistic behaviors that think that it doesn't impact me. And there is this other group of individuals, as Tequila was mentioned, many of us in the Latino and immigrant origin community. If you think about the past presidential election, many Latinos actually didn't go out to vote and we were quite disappointed and upset, right, by the fact that we were given this right, but a lot of people decided to stay home. It's because of that, right, because they're so disillusioned and they think that their vote doesn't matter because the systems that I mentioned before, there is the electoral college, which again, when I go back to the systems, makes it very difficult for people to believe in the system. So that's where all of us have to make sure that we 
mobilize in masses and ensure that each um, vote counts. To me, the hardest part of, of this pandemic and COVID-19 and being in an election year is going back to that first group of individuals that we are so rooted in the individual, not the collective like other countries, when they feel and they feel the sense of entitlement when they think that this is not going to impact them. And I think long term, 10 years from now, five years from now, next year, if the pandemic, of course, continues, of course, it's going to impact you. Of course, the pandemic is going to affect you. The economy is going to, right? But I think about these individuals are so selfish that they don't think that voting is going to have an impact on them. And that's when we have to make sure that we elevate the stories, the narratives, the importance of the census, um, to ensure that people know that it actually matters, that when it comes to voting, it could be a couple of votes that can actually change the jurisdiction or the makeup of that particular school board, that community, right? Um, but again, I always put it into categories. Those individuals are so individualistic and think that they don't doesn't impact them. And those individuals are so disappointed with the system and the systemic inequities that have been there for years that really perpetuate the current um, status quo. I think um, I also have to kind of echo tequila in, in that lack of hope um, that that we have um, really we've gotten kind of um, comfortable in the lack of hope almost. Um, you know, the the entire voting process at the national level um, is just awful. Um, the Electoral College um, really takes away, in some ways, um, the vote of the individual. Um, and I think that that is playing a role in, in why people don't vote. But um, I think that people fail to realize that um, the national vote, right, the federal vote is just one part of the process. And local elections are, in my opinion, essentially more important um, in, in many ways than, uh, than the national vote in um amplifying your communities at a local level when you amplify your communities at a local level then you can build that voice and that coalition and make those changes happen nationally um i rarely call myself an advocate anymore um i call myself an activist um why because uh like Sheila said voting is only a small part of that political process um, and activism and um, putting yourself and your voice on the line in other ways um, equally lends itself to creating those changes that um, people need to see. Um, and I, you know, I will vote um, in all the elections this year. But um, we are sick of the, well, just vote for this person now. And, uh, you know, we can, we can make the change happen later. We can hold out for that progress later. Um, and, and we're tired of that. We're tired of waiting. We've waited our whole lives. We've waited for the lives of our ancestors, um, you know, before us um, and our community members before us who thought they were fighting um, for these changes to occur and they still haven't. And it's, um, it can make a person uh, very hopeless. Yeah, I'm just hearing that there's a lot of apathy and people just feel sort of hopeless. It's you know, which is really sad, but that kind of brings me to my next question. And I'll start with you, um, Juliana, um, as the 
executive director of Connection Americas, um, which is a nonprofit, I believe. But how do you help people? Well, how do you help educate people about maybe the importance of voting or how you how do you guys help with the voting process yeah so i typically don't like to use the word integration but um going given where we are at connection americas we believe that it's a dual process where um we work with immigrant origin families and i typically describe that they come to connection americas and earn or CASA as a friend with the most precious secrets. How do I become an American citizen? How do I enroll my child in school? I have this issue um, with uh, an egregious uh, landlord, right? Or I want to become an American citizen. Where do I start, right? And then it's our role to make sure that we connect them to the resources here in Nashville and in Tennessee, given that we're a statewide organization so they can fulfill um, their dreams, running right? in, in a safe space. Our mission is to make sure that people can belong, contribute and succeed even in a pandemic. Well, at the same time, telling these stories to uh, the rest of Nashville and, and Tennessee, right? And the realities of um, immigrant origin families and the fact that we were part of this of this fabric that 10 years ago, there were we were newly arrived uh, individuals, but now we actually have families here, we have roots here, and many of us can vote and exercise that right. So at Connection Americas, we do so by doing a lot of advocacy work, making sure that all the information is culturally uh, bilingual and appropriate for the 24 countries that speak Spanish, right? It's important also to mention that not all Latinos are monolithic, not all of us think alike, not all of us look alike. Afro Latinos have a very different experience from um, European Latinos, right? Uh, the Mexican experience is very different from the Guatemalan experience or the Venezuelan or Argentine for that matter. So making sure that we're rooted in authentic stories so individuals have the information they need um, to cast um, their vote. Since we are a 501c3, we do not endorse candidates. We are not a 501c4, but we want we need to make sure that we tell the story how it is, so without compromising our values. So from citizenship classes, or making sure that individuals um, can come to our free English classes as well. And this year we've been relying, and Tequila, I'm gonna put you on the spot on the Equity Alliance and, and the Amazing Voter Guide, right? To really contextualize and tell us how the political landscape looks like in, in Nashville and in Tennessee. Personally, for me, that was the guy, and again, I speak English, an American citizen, I hold privilege because of the color of my skin, right? And I use the, their border guide with my family at the dining table while I was translating saying, if you believe in this, look at this candidate. These, is, these are the people who are running for school board. These are the individuals that are in our district, right? It was their guide that we used in our dining table and throughout Connection Americas for individuals to know and see the landscape and also to notice the underrepresentation of minorities when it comes to elected candidates of color or with authentic stories. So again, we believe it's a dual process, right? When we highlight authentic stories from immigrant origin families, in addition to educating their broader community. Casa de Safran is an early voting site, so make sure that if you are in Tennessee and if you are in Nashville, then you come and vote at Casa de Safran October the 14th to the 29th. We are following all the CDC guidelines and we take it very, very seriously to ensure that individuals have a place to come where they feel safe and comfortable to cast um, their vote. So those are a couple of tangible examples of how we are um, operating in this space. Uh, while giving uh, folks the opportunity to um, bring their concerns to us, and then we connect them to individuals who are doing the work like tequila um, that, that we so need right now. Yeah, and um, thank you, Juliana. I was actually going to ask you, Tequila, about um, those free voter guides. Um, will y'all be offering them again this year? And just tell us a little bit about what's in the guide. Yeah, so the voter guide is a nonpartisan tool. Um, and it basically we expanded from the Nashville voter guide to where it's now the statewide Tennessee voter guide. So we have every election that is on the ballot in Nashville, Chattanooga, and Memphis listed in the voter guide. We have some that are available on print that will be placed in some um, black and brown businesses. But for the most part, you can download them at TennesseeVoterGuide.com. 
Again, it's just a tool for people. Some people need to visually see what's on the ballot, who's on the ballot, and they need to have a plan for voting so that they feel a lot more confident and comfortable going to the polls. And so, again, we're just trying to develop as many tools as we can. Um, thank you so much to Juliana for allowing us to, you know, partner with them and hopefully we can start to begin to get some of that information um, interpreted uh, for some of our, our uh, Brown community members, because it, it's really going to take all of us. And so that's one of the things that I love about what the Equity Alliance stands for and what the Voter Guide does, that Voter Guide really is nonpartisan, so it's non-threatening and it just brings people together. That's the alliance part, is that in order to achieve equity, we're going to have to form a strong alliance for people who, regardless of where they come from, who they love, their religion, uh, what they may look like, that all care about us being one nation. So thank you again, Juliana. Thank you, Tequila. And um, Jean Marie, um, you're with the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities. Um, do you all help educate folks about um, voting? I know you told me you're a nonprofit, but what do you all do to let people know what their rights are and things like that? So um, the Council on Developmental Disabilities is nonpartisan. So um, we we don't um, obviously we can't like promote one candidate over another or anything like that. Um, a lot of our work is done with legislators who are already elected to educate them on issues affecting people with disabilities. Um, but one of the programs that we have is uh, Partners in Policymaking. Um, and that's a program for people with disabilities um, and their family members and friends um, can apply to um, take part in that program. And it's a year long program that educates um, the disability community and allies on how to um, be advocates and educate policymakers. Um, and so that that is probably one of the biggest ways and one of my favorite ways that we help um, empower the disability community to um, to speak up and to use our voices to educate lawmakers because a lot of lawmakers don't know what the disability experience is like. Um, and uh, it's different when you get a personal story um, from someone with a disability or from a family member or a friend um, and, and can really lead to that lawmaker changing their mind um, on an issue. Um, and so that's very important. Um, we also do um, write educational pieces for our lawmakers um, for them to understand the impact, both positive and negative, to any piece of legislation as it affects people with disabilities specifically. Um, and the Council on Developmental Disabilities is really one of the reasons why I decided to run for office um, two years ago. So um, they really do um, empower people to fight for the changes that they want to see. So while well, I got you, Jean Marie, you mentioned that you ran for office <laughs> in 2018. Tell us why you decided to run and um, what was your platform? And did having a disability, did that affect the process in any way? Um, so the, the council definitely gave me the final push, I, I feel like, to, to make that run for office. Um, I actually decided when I was a sophomore in college um, that I would run for some form of political office one day. Um, I had faced quite a lot of discrimination at that point in, in many areas of my life. And I was determined that the best way to make those changes happen that I wanted to see was to make them from the inside. Um, and so I majored in political science and got a master's in public administration um, in an effort to 
um, really educate and empower myself more on the political process uh, to prepare myself someday. Um, and my platform, uh, a large part of my platform was, you know, raising the minimum wage in Tennessee to fifteen dollars an hour. Um, there are you, you can't afford a place to live in Chattanooga uh, without making fifteen dollars an hour. Um, affordable housing is all but extinct um, in Chattanooga, and healthcare costs are ridiculous um, if you're not on Medicaid. And Tennessee was one of the states that did not expand Medicaid. Uh, so those were two of the biggest parts of my platform that I was hoping to focus on had I been elected. Um, I did run into difficulties in the process because of my disability. Um, and a part of that was because um, one of my barriers to um, access is transportation. And um, the district that I was running for, District 26, um, a large part of, of that district is outside the city limits. And the transportation that I use only runs inside the city limits. So I ran into a lot of difficulties being able to drive outside the city limits to see um, voters and to meet and speak with voters. Um, and now one of the blessings in disguise of COVID is that so many campaigns are happening largely on a virtual platform. Um, and, and had that happened back in 2018, um, things may have been a little bit different for me. Um, I also got pneumonia in the middle of uh, the general campaign um, for the general election, and that really impacted how some people uh, saw my ability to lead. Um, and I had to fight very hard to educate people um, and prove to them that the ventilator that sticks out of my mouth um, does not in any way inhibit my ability to be a leader and to fight for my constituents. Um, so definitely, definitely. But I did um, have the honor of getting some of the highest votes um, in District 26 against a uh, Republican opponent um, in decades. So um, I do still consider my uh, campaign to be a win. Well, thank you for that. And I'm glad that um, just because you didn't win, it didn't stop you from being an, an activist. So we still appreciate the work that you're doing. It's, it's still so very important. Um, I, I'd like to ask, and Julie, I'm going to touch on it a, a little bit, but how have your communities worked together to further the fight for voting rights? Or, you know, Julia, you mentioned kind of working with the Equity Alliance. Um, are y'all doing other things? Are you working with other communities? Um, is it like, is Connecting on America, because I know it's focused on um, Latin Americans, but do you work with other organizations as well? And and while we're on that, could you talk about your relationship, Connecting on America's a relationship with Casa Asafran? I know some people might not know what that is. So let's start there, right? So Casa Asafran, if you haven't been to Casa Asafran, is of course located in, in Nolensville. Um, and uh, we are a house, una casa for nine um, nonprofit organizations under the same roof from um, a partnership we have with Metro Public Schools. We have a pre K to um, justice for our neighbors who do legal work, our community kitchen, AMAC, who work um, with uh, Muslim Americans here in Nashville, Tennessee, to the clinic. And of course, uh, now uh, the Equity Alliance is also using our, our space. 
uh, and with bilingual, we also have bilingual and bicultural therapists. So Casa Safran um, is, some people call it the community center, but we say it's our home. It's a home to everyone, um, people from all walks of life that are uh, congregating and come to a space, all of our signages in, in Arabic, English, um, and Spanish. In connection with Americans, um, is based in in the building, uh, even though we are a statewide organization. So prior to March um, the 13th, all of us were there uh, about 70, 50 people in a given day, and we share and co-locate and breathe the same air. We're in the same space, but of course now everything is is remote. And Connection Americas owns um, the building, and we have a park in, in the back. So that's Casa Safran, and Casa Safran is the early voting site. So make sure you go vote um if you're voting early and not mailing your um your ballot that you that you vote at casa as a friend in connection america said um owns um the building and, and i would say just i don't want to repeat what i already said but it's um partnering with different sister organizations right to to other organizations that are doing the work um the grassroots work um be it amac um, or the Equity Alliance, educating individuals, right? But for us, it is a matter of uh, telling the stories of individuals who are impacted or left behind uh, when egregious policies are passed or voted on. Now, to give you a specific example, the CARES Act, yes, it was great and beneficial for all of us, but it also excluded um, families who lived in a mixed status um, household, American-born children who have parents uh, with a parent with uh, precarious immigration status. So we were hoping for the HEROES Act. So again, we are contextualizing the realities of immigrant origin families and making sure that those who can vote um, feel safe, comfortable um, to do so the day of or, or before. So I cannot underscore or highlight enough the importance of making sure that people do their research and make a plan the day of or when they go vote. Tequila alluded to this, but Voting for many people is quite easy. They just drive, take uh, their lunch break, and they can go vote. But for the majority of the people that we serve, that is not the case. Specifically, if you don't speak English, right? As I mentioned earlier, it takes time to do that research. All the information is, is in English. And yeah, many of us do speak English, but understanding the intricacies is quite difficult, specifically in Tennessee and specifically in, in Nashville. So. Again, we are proud of, of the work that we're doing, and we also have our staff working on uh, on early voting days there, um, facilitating communication as much as possible when families come in and ask um, for help. Of course, we cannot interfere, but making sure that we have a friendly face at the door um, helps. Um, but um, again, it's through partnering through with other organizations. Um, they are doing the, the local work, canvassing, um, and ensuring that people know uh, of the importance of, of, of voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Tequila, is your organization partnering with any other organizations about voting? Oh, right? wow. <laughs> That's how we do our work. Uh, we believe in the we believe in the notion of collective impact. We're stronger when we work together. So, yes, all of our work is done in collaboration and in partnership. So we could we partner with people to hand out voter guides to do voter registration census work. Um, we're building a plan right now for rights restoration redistricting. Everything that we do is done in collaboration. You know, I'd like to say something about early voting because uh, Juliana has talked about it and you know, I think that. There needs to be a little bit more education about that. I just recently talked to 2 people who, um. Who are educated and vote, but they were a little bit confused about early voting. So my one friend told me that she was going to have to um, take off from work so she could early vote. You know, find out the day for early voting. I'm like, it's two weeks. You have two weeks for early voting. You know, so she thought it was just one day. And I talked to another friend who thought that early voting was at his particular um, voting site. I was like, no, you can go to the library or. Um, <laughs> Council Asifran, you can go, you know, somewhere else to to early vote. So I think um, people still don't know, you know, where they can early vote. And then I do also know some folks. I think it was um, was it Eugene Marie that said you like to vote on the, the day, the voting day. My sister's the same way. This like this energy on the day of voting day. She she doesn't mind waiting in the long line. I like to go and early vote and get it out of the way. So I do think there needs to be some education about that. So 
Juliana, you've been sharing with us. So anybody's looking, you know, you've got two weeks and, and you can go to a couple different sites. Well, Miranda, I want to get in on the conversation again. Um, you know, the State Museum, we do have our ratified exhibition. It'll be up until I think next March. So you can come learn about some of the, the women that um, Miranda and Joyce have talked about. But Miranda, um, Joyce have mentioned Tent City. And that was definitely something that I never learned about. Um, and it's featured in our exhibition. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And I know there were um, a couple of folks that came out as advocates during that time. Um, they're featured in our exhibition, the McFerrins. Could you tell us a little bit about Tent City and what the McFerrins did? And I'd like to start by just taking the opportunity to thank Daphne McFerrin for her assistance with the exhibit. One of the uh, individuals that we feature is Viola McFerrin, and Daphne McFerrin is her daughter. Um, uh, Mrs. McFerrin played a very important role in the voter rights campaign in Fayette County. Um, she and her husband were leaders, and uh, Mrs. McFerrin went on also to play a very important role in school desegregation and other efforts in Fayette County. And um, at that uh, voting rights campaign was really important. Um, one of the things that made it um, such a, a critical part of the civil rights movement here in Tennessee was really the activism of the local people involved, like Viola McFerrin. Um, these were individuals who um, really stood up for their communities. They became very engaged. And even though um, they lived in rural areas that were very economically disadvantaged, they um, faced many obstacles, but overcame them um, and really made great progress um, despite a lot of um, barriers to them. And uh, Mrs. McFerrin was very active um, in voting rights and many other community initiatives in Fake County. Oh, thank you, Miranda. You know, I had never heard of tent cities and once I started researching, you know, I, I read um, someone quoted that sometimes the tents that they lived in once they were evicted were actually better than the, the shack that they had been living in, which is which says a lot and is really sad. But, you know, the McFerrins were still wanting people to get registered to vote. So I think about when people say they just don't want to vote, people lost their homes, <laughs> you know, trying to vote. So I, you know, I want people to go out and vote. Um, so, Tequila, I wanted to get back to you, and I will tell the audience, um, we do want to have time for Q&A. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, so we'll have Q&A in just a few minutes. But Tequila, I really want to talk to you about um, the, Black, the Tennessee Black Voter Project in 2018. I know that you had um, a goal to register, what's it, 50,000, 55,000 Black voters. How many people did you actually end up getting registered? And, and tell us what happened after that. Okay, so on okay. record, I say, that, say my computer, I say that I registered um, 91,000 people because those were the people that we actually um, registered paper, on paper. But we actually registered over 100,000 people because we registered about 20,000 folks online. Um, so that, that was that. Um, Oh, sorry, my, my computer scrolled up. So it was a it was a project that was collaborative again um, with about thirty five different nonprofit organizations. We came together with a goal to register as many Black and Brown voters as possible. We worked with um, Turk, which is the Immigrants Rights and Refugee Coalition. They were a part of that, and from there we you know we exceeded our goal. It was awesome. Um, I mean, I spent so much time traveling across the state. We were excited and then the state legislator decided that they would pass a bill that would essentially criminalize efforts like ours for mistakes on forms. One of the things that we found out is Tennessee usually has about a 50% error rate on forms because we ask for a lot of information on our voter registration form, including your social security number. So it's not odd that people make mistakes on forms. 
Um, but what ended up happening was we, you know, we were specifically targeted. Those efforts were targeted. We weren't allowed to, um, we weren't allowed to test to testify in front of the, the Senate or the state house. We, you know, we reached out, we wanted to defend our work. They held up our forms and said that we have to stop this. And that bill came down and that bill would have essentially made it a felony for people to, um, you know, make mistakes on forms and do voter registration. So here we are standing with the League of Women Voters, and you know the League of Women Voters is a group of sweet women that just do voter registration as a hobby. Most of them, they they have extra time, and they're out, and they're committed to it. And here we are standing with them and with all of these organizations that are looking to us and the state legislator. The one thing that they could do is try to figure out how to criminalize something as non-threatening, so to speak, as voter registration. So it was it was something that it it opened a lot of people's eyes around the country to Tennessee and to some of the things that happened in Tennessee. Because when I started to really dig into Tennessee voting rights history and I learned about Tent City and I learned about all of the things that were happening during the time that the Voting Rights Act of 65 was passed, it was amazing that Tennessee was omitted from Section 4B. So that was something that was extremely interesting, but this this, this voter registration bill really opened people's eyes to what's happening in Tennessee because I think for a while we kind of flown below the radar. So where does that stand now, Tequila? So is it this was in 2018? So what was the end result? So we'll it, it goes in front of the federal judge in 2021. Um, one of the things that we fought for was to make sure that it did not impact the 2020 election, but the state legislature has put some things in place that protects voter registration. Um, and one of those things is just making sure that if you register over so many people, you double check for errors. Um, and, but again, Tennessee as a state is one place where the voting, the, the election commissioner commission offices per county aren't consistent. So one thing that may be frowned down upon on in um, Nashville may be acceptable in Memphis. So Tennessee, I like to say, is ground zero for voter suppression and the wild, wild west as it comes to consistency in voter laws. Lord, can you believe we're having this conversation in 2020? You know, talk Absolutely. about being It's amazing. Um, looks like we've got a couple. So before we get to um, our questions, I do want to ask um, about your role models. Um, you know, my late grandma Frances was um, very involved in politics and she tried to get her grandkids involved and my sister's very involved. Um, I vote, <laughs> that's my involvement. Um, but it was really important for me to see people who looked like me being involved in the process. So who have been some of your role models and mentors for doing the advocacy and activism work that you do? Liliana, we start with you. Uh, so, uh, as I said earlier, right, I think the, the fact that I can I can vote and, and I can speak on behalf of um, immigrant origin families in, in, in Nashville and Tennessee is a testament to those who came before me, of course, my family members and individuals who were um, involved in the civil rights movement. But Actually, I am incredibly inspired by youth, this Generation Z that is um, going out every single day and making sure that we hear and we feel um, what they're seeing every day, the, the people that were marching and they were out there um, reminding us of the inequities that we're seeing every single day. Like I am I'm very much energized by what they're bringing to the table and it gives me a lot of hope because when you see it, um, this is the most diverse um, population that this country has seen. Um, I was looking at some numbers and um, the power that they have if they actually vote, right? It's one thing to go and march, but we have to make sure that they also vote, that college students also vote, that those people that turn 18 were registered to vote and actually do it, right? But I, I was and I am continuously um, impressed by this this movement um, of ensuring that they hold us and they hold our parents, 
our grandparents, of course, accountable for the work that we didn't do or that we are shattering right now in, in 2020, 2019. So I would say that I, they are my role models right now when I have conversations with students that are part of our education programs and they tell us, yeah, I actually sat at the table and I had a hard conversation with my grandmother because we don't agree on this issue, but I am tired of the inequities we're seeing when it comes to um, race, equity, class, um, capitalism, right? So I am energized by that. And I just hope that we actually see it in the polls. We actually see people voting. Um, but again, uh, this is just a movement that started with our ancestors, our grandparents, my parents, with me, but also it needs to be carried with those um, that are following in, into our, our, our footsteps. And the work that has been done in Nashville and in Tennessee has been really exciting because as Tequila mentioned, if we lose sight, if we rest for a minute, we just don't know what's going to happen um, tomorrow. So again, I, our, our job is to encourage youth uh, to keep fighting and to do it so um, gracefully so we can continue to support them. We owe it to them and we owe it to our children. Jean Marie, what about you? Any role models or mentors or any people that are inspiring you to do the work you do? Yeah, so um, my biggest role model um, is Judith Human. Um, Judith Human has been a part of the disability rights movement um, her entire uh, adult life. Um, she, I believe she has um, uh, polio, if I'm not mistaken. And she had to sue the state of New York um, for the right to, to um, she was excluded um, based on her disability. Um, and she was a huge part of the independent living movement, um, which got its start in Berkeley, California. Um, she was part of the group that locked themselves um, in uh, an office for the Section 504 sitting. Um, to this day, it is still the largest um, disability rights sit in. Um, and uh, in history, and she just her um, willingness to put herself on the line and to fight for her rights and for the rights of um, other people with disabilities is just. It, I look up to her so much for all of that and for everything um, that she has taught me in how to be an activist um, and in when to know which tactics to use uh, when fighting for your rights. Um, I think it's important also to note that uh, I also really admire in general um, the fact that um, there is this um, movement across minorities, intersectionality, if you will, um, of people finally really joining forces um, and getting together and, and fighting for our rights. Because even though we're all affected by things in different ways, we all want and deserve the same things. Um, and I think that in um, in years past, um, it hasn't happened as widespread. And I think that we really are seeing, um, not just across the state, but across the country, uh, this realization that we are stronger collectively um, than we are separately. Um, and I very much admire the leaders that are coming together for that. Yeah, for sure. So, so I'm going to get to you in just a minute. I, I did want to read something that someone just put in the chat box. It's not a question, but it's from Maria. And she says, um, I've never understood why every single person doesn't actively support disability rights. And I agree with her. She says anyone can end up part of the um, disability community at any time. Um, so 
that's that's so true. It affects every community that we've talked about. But Tequila, um, who've been some of your role models or um, some people that inspire you to do the work that you do? Um, so it's funny that you ask that. I grew up in, in a um, very in the inner city in Chattanooga, and so where I grew up, I, I never until I became an adult knew about voting about any of that. But in college, my best friend now, Christian Bulls, who's also on the Davidson County School Board, um, she was the first person that actually really started getting me to think about what it means to be politically engaged in college. And so we would we would organize for um, Harold Love and she would take me up to the state capitol and we would sit in on subcommittee hearing meetings. And this one, I was like 19, so you can imagine what that was like. And I would hear this group of men, majority, who didn't look like me, didn't reflect anything that I had experienced, make decisions for people who looked like me and who had experienced some similar things that I experienced in life. And so I began to really think about what that power looked like and how to really get our community to really tap into it. And from there it was just this awakening. I mean, I can't even really remember what made me open my eyes, but it was this awakening. And I have to just be honest and say, we're the same age, but I attribute a lot of me actually awakening to what it means to be politically and civically engaged to Christian books. Thank you. Well, um, we don't have that much time left, so um, I'd like to sort of end with um, talking about self-care. You know, it's a buzzword now, but back in the day of the suffragists and the um, civil rights leaders, I don't know that they talked about it, um, but, you know, it's so important so that you can continue to do this work. This work is challenging and, and, and exhausting. So how are you guys taking care of yourselves, especially during, this is such a strange time, but how are you taking your care of yourself so you can continue to do the advocacy and activism work that you do. Oh, so for me, I am really intentional about what I eat. I realize that when I eat sugar, it really impacts my moods. I also, I have a therapist. I go to therapy every two weeks and I work out, I do CrossFit. So <laughs> that really helps me. And, you know, it's something simple as to just journaling. Um, during this whole pandemic, I have done a photo shoot every month. Hello. And I have really <laughs> documented my experience during this time because, I mean, this is a, like you said, this is some really difficult, strange times. And I want to be that strength 20 years from now that people who are in a, another little black girl that comes from the inner city that wants to do this work, she can draw on my strength. So that right there is self-care for me. Thank you, Tequila. What about you, Juliana? <laughs> yeah, I love everything that you just said, Tequila. I'm not that good with my eating habits, I have to admit. <laughs> um, no, I would say for me it has been eliminating distractions. I think it's very easy now to get carried away by your phone or Twitter or the news or the message. And for me, I try really hard to minimize distraction. I sort of like the team jokes because I try to say, okay, is this an emergency? Is this a problem or is this an annoyance, right? There are some things that are just annoying and don't require our energy. They don't even need our energy. And there are some things that require our full self. Family is, is, is important um, to me, um, my parents, right? Uh, when we decided that they're going to be part of our, our physical bubble, right? And then we could see and embrace each other because Again, we come. I come from this background where we still speak Spanish, and I see my parents and the families that we serve every single day. So, and then of course, trying to go on walks, but it's it's hard. Uh, for me, this work is so important that uh, right now I just started uh, about a year and a half ago, and I'm giving it my all to Conexión Americas, to immigrant families, to Latino families in a pandemic. So again, as much as I can minimize distractions, but also do the best work that I can to be fully present because as Tequila mentioned, there's too much at stake right now in coming November and with the pandemic as well. So I wish I could eat healthier uh, Tequila. And I said I was going to only have one cup of coffee, but that's impossible. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think I leaned into sugar, which was 
that thing to do. Um, Jean Marie, what about you? So What's your self care? I I actually take self care very seriously. Um, I do have a I have a counselor therapist um, that I see like once a month or so just to touch base and learn new techniques to be more mindful and more intentional about myself um, and learn to continue to still find ways to live life um, within the world that we live in now with COVID. Um, but I go every six weeks and I get a pedicure with my mom um, and we go out to lunch. So that's like our designated mother daughter time. Um, we see each other way more often than that, but that's like our guaranteed time. Um, I also experiment with hair. Um, you can't really tell because of lighting in here now, but currently I'm sporting a neon yellow wallet, um, which is my current um, <laughs> current uh, adventure um, in hair care. Um, I like faucet. I make sure that I I shut the computer off. I know I listen to a book on tape out on my balcony and I cross it for like an hour and a half every day. Um, but my cross stitching is entirely non activist driven um, because I'm currently working on a cross stitch um, that I created myself um, for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, to raise money for the local bill fund in Chattanooga. So even my self-care slips into activism for me, so I have to be careful sometimes with myself because um, I can sometimes have a hard time letting go and, and backing away from fighting for people because that's a, you know, a passion of mine. Um, and then I'm going back to school because I can. Um, oh, wow. I, I'm fortunate that I work for a university, so I have the opportunity to go back to school and take some classes. Um, and so I'm just doing it for me and having fun. Well, thank you. Well, it looks like our time is, is um, just about up. Um, so I would like to thank Juliana, Jean Marie, Miranda, and Tequila for spending an hour and a half with us. Um, you know, Juliana, you mentioned family, and my one of my family members just texted me that this was great, but there's a football game starting. So <laughs> I guess he's about to go watch the football game. <laughs> but I, I appreciate everything that you all are doing. Um, thank you for being here tonight. And, you know, my final tonight is, you know, I'd like to honor all of the people who fought so hard for the right to vote, people died, lost their homes, and, you know, starved themselves. And I'd like to honor them with just two words to end this, and that is, please vote. So, um, Joyska, are we good? Is it, is our time up? Yep, it's time. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, ladies, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm glad you were here. Hope you learned something. Visit the Tennessee State Museum. We're open every day. We're following um, temp taking temperatures and wearing masks. So come visit us in Nashville. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.